So we will be enjoying ourselves together until 3.15. All right, so just out of curiosity, how many of you have only been coaching since September? You have something called 
a time chart. You should have time chart one, time chart two, and time chart three, somewhere in that package. And they're actually, they should be in order of how we're going to see them on the screen. That's why they're not one, two, three. On the right hand side, you also have something called the levels of intensity for instructional coaching.
Would you like to know how that story ended? <laughs> Not pretty. Because she turned around and said, and honey, what do you think you're going to teach me? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I thought, first card in the rule, I just broke it. One year. For one year, I could not get into her classroom. I could be a resource provider. I gave her lots of things. I could bring people to her classroom, and she would welcome them in her classroom and talk to them. She was a very serious teacher. But the minute I stepped to the door, she was right at that threshold. Yes? One year, last day of school, she came up to me and she said, did you learn your lesson? She wasn't my first coach, but she was a pretty important one. And so, again, you can't force yourself on anybody. You have to build trust. You have to build relationships. You have to get into the fear factor and find out what it is about teachers that make them either want you in their classrooms or not. Now remember, you're not in a classroom right off the bat. It is not one-on-one -on -one unless you're lucky enough to coach in a building where you don't have to renegotiate your role with your peers, and somebody, one of your friends says, sure, come on in, let's work together. But if you don't have an emissary of goodwill like that, baby steps, and everybody is different, and every case is situational. And in some cases, the one-on-one -on -one just won't happen right away. It will happen after the small group. It's an outgrowth of the small group. We'll talk about that later as well. Job embedded professional learning, instructional coaching is the only way that you have side-by-side, -side, shoulder to shoulder support. It's in real time. I don't have to wait for a consultant to come a month later or six weeks later. I don't have to go online to try to find an answer. I work with my coach and I work with my coach on a daily basis. That doesn't mean my coach, doesn't mean you are in the classroom with the same teacher every day, but it does mean that you establish a relationship so that you work with folks in the classroom so that you break down those walls that might be prevented change. You are change agents. That is what your role is. Your role is to help teachers identify what practices work well and what practices need to be strengthened. That's your role. If you only coach and you're a, you are only a resource provider, you will always only be a resource provider. You've got to move along that continuum to help go from providing resources all the way up to being classroom supporter. And that takes time. Confidentiality will make you or break you. Another true story, coach is walking down the hall, Happened to have a great relationship, worked with the teacher for two years. Great relationship. Principal was coming towards the coach and said to the coach, Alyssa, how did Miss Jones do in the classroom today? And Alyssa said, it was a fabulous, fabulous session. You're not going to believe all the kids were engaged. It was great. Guess who's behind the coach? The teacher. Later on that day, coach goes up knocks on the teacher's door because it was their regularly scheduled period to work together. Coach, the teacher meets her at the door and says, yes. Coach kind of looks at him, yes, what do you mean, yes? It's our time, she thought she was kidding. It's our time. No, I'm sorry, you can't go to my class anymore. What do you mean I can't? What, what, what's going on, what are you talking about? I heard what you said. Coach for a hot minute said, wait a minute, you heard what I said where? I heard what you said <coughs> to the principal. And the teacher and the coach said, yeah, it was great, wasn't it? I told her how great, great it was in your classroom. What did I go to that and you shouldn't be doing it, confidentiality. Exactly right. You know, and I think we need to, and I don't know what I'm saying. No, but, you know, the administrator signed on knowing this. Correct. Knowing this. And it has to be reiterated. Right. Now, here's the tricky part. That coach never got back into that teacher. It absolutely destroyed that relationship. And that coach was devastated. She's still a coach. Was devastated. Understands what happened. Good or bad, like you said, good or bad, you're breaching confidentiality if you say anything at all about a teacher's practice. Now, there are going to be times when an administrator just, need, I, I just need to know what's going on. 
This is not a deficit model. Coaching is not a deficit model. You don't work with those teachers who have marginal experience, who are on these work plans, these improvement plans. They may be part of the number of teachers you work with, but they're not the whole of it. Can we move this down? Just because I would like to see you fancy pieces over here. Thank you. Again, it's not a deficit model. Deficit model is being that administrator will say to the coach, I want you to work with those three teachers over there because they can't control their classes. Now, I'm sure you've had this experience. You're in a school. You know who can control a class and who can't. So if I'm the teacher who can't control my classroom, and you're the teacher who can, and you're the coach, and you're working with me, what does it say to that teacher? You're working with those teachers who are needy. So are you going to ever let her come into your classroom? Of course not. But you don't want to be considered needy. That's what I mean about a deficit model. So if you're in a building where the administrator says you have to work with these identified teachers, your answer is you can't be insubordinate. Your answer is, well, of course I'll work with them, but I'm going to work with everybody across the content areas. And then you make sure your schedule includes people from other departments or grade levels or experience levels. That's what you have to do. So that's the first thing to think about. Confidentiality is right up there with that. If it's a deficit model, everybody knows who's needy, and nobody wants to be identified with that. It's rare when a teacher who is so needy says to you, I know I'm needy. It happens, and I've never met a teacher who doesn't want to do better at his or her craft, but that's different than being assigned only working with those marginal teachers. So that's the first thing you have to think about. And, and move around. And I'm hoping at this point, if you've experienced it, you've moved beyond that. Is that true or false? I mean, here's the, this is the Vegas room, you can tell me. So is there anyone here experiencing that right now and is not quite sure how to navigate that system? Great, perfect, okay. Our goals for today will be to talk about what that BDA cycle is. What does it look like? How do you spend your time in doing that? Because again, what happens before, what happens during, and what happens after are very deliberate ways that you as a coach will work with teachers. It's a way of institutionalizing, seriously, and institutionalizing your practice working with teachers. We're going to reinforce your understanding of one-on-one -on -one and building trusting relationships. Again, not everybody can start with the one-on-one, -on -one, but you want to move towards that. Let me ask you a question. How many people here have had any kind of lessons? Piano lessons, golf lessons, tennis lessons. Raise your hand if you've had it. Okay. How many of you have had group <coughs> lessons in those areas, group lessons? Of the same people, how many of you have had one-on-one -on -one with the same thing? Which one gives you the more personal attention? The one-on-one. -on -one. And that's why we work towards that. That's where change takes place. As I said earlier, change doesn't take place because I've given professional development. And I've given out 9,042 documents with all the bells and whistles. That's not where it takes place. I'm telling you, I started teaching in 1973. I had drawers and drawers and drawers full of the most beautiful transparencies, okay? transparencies and bells and whistles and every book under the sun. Ask me how many times I tried to use it. Each one once. Each one once. How successful was I? Nuns. Nuns. Because I didn't have anybody on my side saying, here's how. Let's talk about how you want to use it. Let's talk about how you think we should use it. And then after I use it, let's talk about how we think it. I never had that. So that, that then helps us think about what do we want to do as we work with teachers. We want to practice reflection and dialogue. Reflection needs to occur in order for change to happen. You have to think about your practice. You have to think about in practice, in action, on action, about action. You have to help teachers understand. But you have to become reflective also. Now, you're lucky. You all have mentors to work with you. 
That's incredible. We're the only ones. Pick is the only one that has that the way we have it. Tish happens to be a mentor. So we're lucky. She's here. She's giving me moral support. And so think about that and how you have people. It's the mentor is the coach's coach. So the students have the teachers, the teachers have the coaches, the coaches have the mentors, and the mentors actually have their RMCs to help support them. All of this is part of the picture. Instructional coaching should never be a case where you walk in and say to a teacher, so what do we want to talk about today? That's not instructional coaching. It's what do you want to talk about today that we can plan, talk about, practice together, reflect on for the next time, or for when we're inside. So you have to think about it in terms of your work is very, very deliberate. Now, some of you may be in situations where somebody tells you what it is that you have to do. You have to work with these six teachers and you have to only do this, this, and this. That may happen, and you will do that. But because you are now going to be more experienced in the, the world of PIP, if you will, then you start looking about, let me do it in a three-pronged cycle. Let me do it in a before, during, after. Let me think about what fits into the four quadrants. I promise you, you will have people changing their practice if they feel comfortable with you and comfortable in sharing what their goals are, and you can help them with that. You know, we're in an age now with the evaluation. Think about your role in that evaluation. You don't evaluate teachers, but you're working with teachers and you're helping teachers collect evidence of what it is that they're doing. You also have to do that. I don't know if you're aware that on SAS, there is a document, you know, with the Danielson, you'll all be evaluating the Danielson model for teachers, everyone, whether you're a coach or not. Deb was also a model, sorry, you're also our mentor. You, you will be evaluating using that model. There is a document on SAS that is made up of the examples and evidence for each of the Danielson's framework models, and that's so that your administrator can take a look at it and say, oh, here's my coach, Here's what a coach does for distinguished. Here's what a coach does. Here's what it looks like for proficient and all four categories. That document is on SAS, and that document was written in large part by, by those not in this room because you're all new, but some of your colleagues who are sitting in our room for the next three days. And that's really good to know. Before we go really into coaching, I want you to take a look at these four people. Independently, you don't have this in your room. Power. Take a look at these four people and silently jot down who's number one, who's number two, who's number three, and who's I thought that was great for coaches. You have to believe that A, teachers want to change, they do. You have to believe that instructional coaching is transformational. It's not reform, it's transformational because it takes practices that have been tried many times and it makes folks step back and say, wow, let me think about what I've been doing. If I've been teaching this just because, that's not good enough. It, it really helps you step back and think about why am I teaching what I'm teaching? How am I teaching it? Is it successful in whatever my goals are? And if not, what can I do about that? And that's where you come in as a coach. Your role is incredibly important. The more you do with teachers about transforming their practice, the more your practice takes root. Giving out books, duplicating materials, being an extra pair of hands in a classroom is not instructional coaching. It may be a piece of what you do. It is not the whole of it, and it's not where results happen. And by results, <coughs> I am not talking about test scores. I am talking about having teachers understand what their practice is, reflect on it, think about what's working and what's not working, how we can make changes and adjust our teaching, and then pushing for the goal. That's what this is. This process can be used in classrooms. Teachers can use it when you do professional development with your teachers. And 
by the way, as we talk about the BDA process, you need to think, how can I help teachers understand that there is a BDA process and that I'm working with them on this process so that they can also see their own work. It's really metacognitive, and that's what we're trying to do. Pick model, this is just a review from earlier. Working one-on-one -on -one in small groups and using the BDA cycle. You need, you need to understand it. You get incredible help from your mentors. Here, tap into Tish and to Deb right now. You have that, but it's also to help teachers understand what, what that is and why it's important. Focusing on collecting, analyzing, and using data. Data is meaningless if you're not talking to people about it. Handing a teacher some statistics, that doesn't do it. Talking to teachers about what's happening in the classroom, planning with them in the group, working with them to identify some goals, and then getting into the classroom to see it, and then debriefing afterwards with them, that's where change happens. Always talk about using evidence-based literacy practices. We're lucky, we've got Joe, we've got PLN. We're very fortunate in that. Solid literacy base across all content areas. Some of you, by the way, I know do reading apprenticeship, all also solid. The point is to have a targeted focus of literacy across all content areas. Not just in English classroom, or not just in reading, not just in social studies or math, it's all across. We want to support reflective and non values of practice, and what does that mean? Here's where, here's where the rubber meets the road. In the before, you meet in the before. You plan, you identify goals with the teacher, but you identify the goals that the teacher wants you to do as a coach, and then if you're modeling, you're going to identify the, the goals of the teacher. Remember I said earlier, teaching and learning, that's reciprocal, that's what this is. You're before stage, you identify your goals, you clarify your roles, you set up the time to meet for the after, and you set it up in the before. Anybody want to take a guess why? Because otherwise, exactly right, otherwise it that's where the change takes place. By the way, you can work with a teacher who comes up with the most magnificent lesson plan that you can ever imagine. But if there's no talk about the execution of that lesson plan, about that delivery, it's lost. It's lost. In the door, you can go to, you can model, you can visit, you can take notes. Now, in the before, you and the teacher are, you and the teacher are co constructing what you look for. Those are your goals. And when you go to work with the teacher, you go in that classroom, you may see 752 things that you would like to address. But guess what? What? Long as the word, you're only talking about the ones that you agree upon with that teacher. But you're going to lead them in a conversation to help them recognize that more must be done. There are no lone rangers in the door. You are not in that classroom and have a teacher say to you, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Do you mind if I run to the office? I have to make some phone calls. Yeah, I mind. When I started coaching, this is no lie, I taught every single class. We were on a block schedule. I taught every single class for a day for three years. And at the end of the three years, I kept getting, I don't understand. Nobody's changing anything. I had the best three years of my career. But guess what? I didn't, I didn't transform anybody's practice. You know why? Because I was doing it. Because I wasn't really ready to be the passion of my life. And that was, part, that was my problem. And I didn't have anybody to talk to to say, if you want to change practice, you've got to have a gradual release of responsibility. I talked about you being a slow learner. I was a slow learner. There are no lone rangers. You don't do it for someone. You do it with them. And that happens in the door. <coughs> and in the after, you're going to offer feedback through reflection. Feedback works. Both parties have to be ready for it. So you don't give feedback. You don't debrief right after that class. Because it doesn't give you any time to think, and it doesn't give the teacher any time to think. 
because you want to go back to the goals and say, these are the goals that I set up. Now, what did I see? What did I do? What did I think worked well? And what didn't work well? You need time. Feedback has to be specific. It has to be timely, so you don't let it go more than a week. You can't let it go more than a few days. It's got to be descriptive. You tell them. You talk about it, going back to the goals. And it has to be non evaluative that's the only way feedback works. Talk to your partner. Tell me which of these three phases do you, do you find yourself you're most comfortable doing? Which one? Is it easy for you on the four? Yeah? Yeah, that's easy. Plan, you go, you co construct, you know what you're going to look for. That's great. Then there's the Dory. That's great too, right? Yes, yeah, one to five, great. Go in, I can see what they're doing, and the after. How many of you never get to the after? And you don't have to be embarrassed because that's the bad answer. You don't. Can you First of all, you don't have time. It's very difficult to create that. Second of all, if you're part time, are you part time? No. Okay. And what grade level? 9 through 12. Okay. But it's always, uh, I'll get back to you. Of course. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, not this week. Period. Period. 
good at that. Oh, absolutely. They want help, but they're afraid. So let's help them understand how to break down their fear. Their fear. You had a question. Well, um, how, how does the, say the superintendent then, how does he or she, if she's able, they need to collect data. You know, is this job worth it? Should we keep this, should we keep this coaching position? They need to prove to the board that this is worth it or not worth it. So how do you suggest the district build up. Well, what is it that they're collecting? Are they collecting that you're doing your job, or are they collecting that the teachers are receptive, or are they collecting that the administrator has given ample opportunity for teachers and coaches to work together? What are they collecting data on? Because if they're collecting data on test scores, it's not going to work. Because it takes time to change. You have to change. I have to believe that it's going to change. And then I have to practice it. And then I have to change it. So when you have an administrator, that's why I said resource provider is not what's going to institutionalize a practice. Here are all the, the many professional development sessions as a coach I've done. In September with the third grade teachers, I did this. In, in October, I did this. In November, I did I almost lost track of the months. In November, I did this. In December, I did that, right? Then you make a, a big one. Big one is you as a coach, if you can, I talk a lot in shoulds and I apologize for that, but I don't work there, I can say that. <laughs> so you should think about how do I do mini professional development? Every Tuesday, I am going to take a concept, pick it, and all day long on Tuesday, I'm going to do it's only going to be 30 minutes because whatever long that camp prep period is, I don't want to take all the time because you have to go to the bathroom. Make a phone call, right? 30 minutes on Tuesday, five times, I'm going to do the same thing. And I'm going to send out a little email to everybody or post something. Come and visit me in room, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to do that. You might have to do that a couple of months. It works great. It, it works great if you can buddy up with another teacher and have you and the teacher co-plan, co-facilitate this many professional development. And then, all of a sudden, you have a list of things that you've done with the staff. Then you say to <coughs> the administrator and the superintendent, visit us on a Tuesday, visit us on a Thursday, see what we do. Remember, administrators cannot be part of the debriefing, and they should not be part of the before. Because in the before, done right, a before is you and the teacher talking about the needs and what that teacher wants you to look as a coach, they don't want an administrator there, and the administrator should not be there. The administrator can come in the glory, right? The administrators can walk around, go into it, and observe any place. That's why you visit, not observe. I was thinking when you were going through the process that as time goes on and you build relationships, the before becomes so much more critical. Absolutely. And initially, so yeah. often, teachers will go, well, I don't know, whatever, you pick it. Yes. Or if you've done a professional development or discussed something, they'll say, yeah, whatever, let's do that. Yeah. And then the after in the reflection often becomes the before. The Absolutely. Next. But it is getting them to focus on something that they really, truly feel is of value to them. Exactly. So I think the before becomes one of the more difficult parts. And once you can get them to focus in on something that they truly are interested in changing, then the rest can follow much more easily. I mean, every stage is tough. It really is. Just when you, that's why I said just when you think you knew it, that it's the next step. But think for a moment about something else also as you're working with the teachers. You're right there. A lot of time the teacher will say, just tell me what, just tell me, you know, just tell me. They're tired, they're overworked, they've got too many kids that they're need to check off papers. It's hard for them, so you're there to help them. You're not there to do it for them, you're there to help them get their voice and help them choose the things that are important. One of the things I didn't say that I hope happened with all of you is that in the beginning of the year, when your administrator was rolling out this instruction coaching model, you and your administrator stood side by side to talk to the faculty about instructional coaching. When that happens, 
right there in front. The administrator has to hear from you, and hopefully it's not the first time you're talking to the administrator, but you need to share a vision. You as a coach, and it may be now, mid-year, you say to your administrator, can we have a meeting? Let's, set, let's do a check here. Let's see if where we are for our goals. Now, if you met in the beginning of the year and you were able to talk about school-wide goals, revisit those school-wide goals mid-year so that you and your administrator are on the same page. That staff, have to, they, they have to see it. When we train, I train administrators in the room with the coaches, and the reason for that is because I want to be the one to say the to the administrator, don't ask your coach how Mrs. Jones is doing. And then your coach can follow up. Well, remember when we did this, here's the reason why. It's just reiterating. So it's easier when it happens in the beginning and when everybody is together, you share a vision of what instructional coaching is. And if you haven't done that with your administrator, do it now. And say, this is my mid-year reflection. I would like to just take the pulse of what's going on. I want to know what your vision is and what your whole idea, what do you think is going on? No names. And you make that clear. We're not going to talk about individual teachers. But we are going to talk about grade level or content area practice. An administrator might say to you, you know, walking around the classroom, I noticed that no, none of the teachers in the math department think about critical thinking. They don't do that. They want to, you know, here's the problem, here's the answers, just do it. They don't think about the literacy of that. That's great for you to say, that's a great topic to have with many professional development. And, you know, I'll work on that. Can I come back and get some ideas from you, or would you like to come facilitate it? It's better to have a teacher to do that, but let's say, you know, you might have an administrator that gets into the thick of things. That's great. Have them do that. But that's part of explaining to a superintendent by showing them what you're doing. Yes? Sorry. No, I stop don't. apologizing. Okay, I won't apologize. Okay. I do think that another piece of it is that reflection tool that they have as well. You can always fill up your reflection tool, which is located online, print that off, fill it out, give that to your superintendent as well, because that increases your accountability also. And, and that's a very, and it's actually pretty critical for you guys as well, because of the, the uh, not only does it have you reflect, but where are you going from there as well. Exactly, because you need to plan. You know, the only thing different between, different between you and a classroom teacher is you don't have your own papers to mark, but you certainly have all the lesson planning to do because you're working with each of the teachers. <laughs> and that's why you don't sit in an office, you don't talk to a computer all the time, but you give yourself permission that you should be doing it a little bit at a time. Think about that. Okay. Yes? The media. Yes. I mean, I fully understand that, okay. that this is a shift. Yes. Job embedded professional. Yes. I guess, and you kind of touched on this, and I'm not sure how much further you could go into it, but who's creating that clarity and that shift for teachers? For a BDA? The yes. process? That we are, we are shifting to this BDA process. Right. <clears throat> and that everybody understands. Right. That's I understand that we're communicating. Yes. That. Right, and that's what, right, that's what I meant by having an administrator side by side with you. The rollout is incredibly important. So the steps would be, one, you as a coach meet with an administrator and say, what are your goals for school-wide improvement? Here are instructional coaching goals for school-wide improvement. Hopefully they're aligned, and they will be, and they will be. And then the step, second step is how do we make the, how do we build awareness and make the staff understand that this is now what we're going to do? If that didn't happen, you're behind the ankle, okay, and you're constantly pedaling, but all is not lost. Because then you have to say, at the next professional development day, at the next staff meeting, at the next faculty day, whatever your school is doing, you and the principal together talk about instructional coaching and what your goals are for instructional coaching and how it works best. And you talk about the BDA model. 
You're not pinpointing anybody who's doing it or not doing it. You're not putting your finger on anything about blame, but you're talking together about this process. And then you as a coach go into individual pockets. You have emissaries of goodwill. So you go to your friends. If you're in the building, are you in a building where you also talk before? Yes. Okay, sometimes that's good and sometimes that's bad. Been there both, both times. You have, you have some friends that you've worked with before and you're gonna to say to them, listen, how, did, how does this sound to you? And you talk to them about the BDA. And before, during, it, what does that mean to you? That's a one-on-one -on -one that you do with your friend. Pick your, pick your friend's brains and start hearing, remember we said listening, Start listening to what your friends have to say. And then the next time, it's that friend and that friend brings another friend. And the three of you talk. Then you might do the mini professional development. And it may be around the BDA. It may not be a concept. It may not be you know, talking to the text. It may be around BDA. Here's what we know about playing with teachers. And you go through that process. Does, does that sound something that you could oh, talk about? Yeah, yeah. I feel like. In some ways it's happened, and in some ways it hasn't. I feel like, uh, and I'm just speaking to my own. But you're not alone. I, I, I realize, I feel like it's a general yeah. statement that applies to me. Am I wrong? No, it's. <laughs> Don't feel yeah. me <laughs> um, But communicating that out front and yeah. often, yes. I just feel like it's. It's so important to our role. Otherwise, we devolve into the support role. Exactly. And, and those are some of the things that you had mentioned earlier. Yes. And there's a lot of uh, cleaning up right. that has to happen once that happens. And I will tell you, remember earlier I said a teacher has to have a practice. It has to actually be <coughs> practice 20 times. You know, when you know, you learn new vocabulary. You probably don't even think about this because it's automatic for you. But if a kid has to learn and use a vocabulary word 80 times before it becomes part of a working vocabulary, it's the same thing with the practice. Just because you say it once or twice doesn't mean anything. It's giving the information. It's not helping people internalize it. So that's why you have to revisit it often. Mid-year is a perfect time to bring together your administrators and say, let's talk about practice. Not individuals. Let's talk about instructional coaching. And let's take a pulse. Principal, what, are your, what were you thinking about instructional coaching when you decided that you would have one? What were your goals? What are the school's goals, the school-wide improvement goals? And now, where are we? If it's all about scores, there's, there's trouble in River City. Because scores are, you know, that doesn't come right away. And if it does, there's usually a dip afterwards. So you have to think about it in terms of that. The best way is bring them together, communicate openly, and revisit that. And then take it from there. And you had your hand up. Somebody else, both of you had your hand up? We did it differently. I guess so we're in not a huge district, but a relatively large district. And so I feel like that line from district goals to building goals to individual teacher goals, it all gets very muddy and then it begins to feel very overwhelming. Like really what are the big overarching things that we're focusing on? And how do you get everybody on the same page? and moving in a similar direction. I can tell you what I would do in a case like that, where I felt everything was all over the place. I didn't know where to start because everything was all over. First thing I would do is I would bring some teachers together and I would do a focus group. Tell me what you think we need to do in this building. That's the first step. At the, the building, building level. At the building level. Because guess where the change is going to take place? The building level. Yeah. That's the voice. Now, it's it sounds very easy when I'm saying it. It's not so easy in practice. Okay. <laughs> what I do are you? Sorry. What I do are you? Okay. Okay. So your mentor, you, I, Diane Pavona. So bring her in on that. That's the first thing that I would do. In the same way, I would do with this gentleman. And I don't know his name. Deb. Did you tap him? I'm sorry. Pay attention. Um, <laughs> yes. what, what are you, what are you I'm in 23. 23, okay, so Steph is your, Stephanie Schwab yes, is your mentor. Bring her in on that conversation. Yeah, sure. She will be very helpful. I'm just the same as to the BDA sometimes. Nice and loud. So when, sometimes when you want the 
want that perception of where you fit as a coach in with administrators and teachers, and you want an administrator to, to present you in the right light. It's also kind of what administrators are, are supposed to be doing with the Danielson models now. There's supposed to be a before where there's a discussion, and then during is when they come in and observe, and the after is the reflection. So if you can somehow for your administrators make the connection that what their expectation is of their teachers with it's a BDA for their evaluation, and if you can say to your teachers, it's the same, and say to your administrators, it's the same, it kind of helps administrators and teachers see that that flow is there. And if it sees, if they see the alignment and the connection, you're right. <laughs> Now, when you do that, just make sure you're not part of the conversation about evaluation. Right. That is not your role. And any administrator who brings you in to say, I'd like to talk about evaluation, I want you to be part of the evaluation for this teacher. Your answer is, gee, you know, I think that's really an administrative role to take. Please don't include me in that. Just know that as a coach, I work with all the teachers on their roles and collecting the evidence that they need see whether or not they're moving their roles. That's all you have to say. But you might have to say it 25 times. Right, my comment is process, yes. not product. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay, so you think about that. Going back to your so first thing, I, that's the first thing that I could do. And then you move from there. You take it from the, you, take, you know, it's like smallest denominator. You take it from there and you build up. At some level, my guess is in your building, not unlike other buildings, the teachers had nothing to do with the school wide or strategic planning at any, it, it, nothing, okay? It's, it, but what you want to do is ultimately you want to show that the district goals should be the same as, the, as all the goals should be the same. How you get there will differ. It's making an action plan. Or what is it, I want to be here, I want to move from point A to point B. What do I need to do to get there? What do I need? What materials, what resources? How do I do that? And then how do I know whether I got there or not? So that's the first thing. Bring those folks together for that. Diane can help you also. And there, are, there are about four other steps that you can take that, that we'll try to connect and talk about that. OK? But it's definitely doable. And your teachers will love it because you will help them. They don't need to think about the thousand foot. They need to think about right here and how they're doing their jobs. OK. So now, we're a little bit off time because we're going to be finished at 315 and I didn't go to what I want you to do so I'm going to ask you to move ahead and I'm going to ask you to take out time chart exercise one. And for the next maybe three or four minutes I want you to on the right hand side I want you on the right hand side I want to know Pick any day. Now, we were going to do a do now, and I was going to let you focus on one person. So just think about either a person or a typical day. Yesterday. Wait, no, this is Sorry. <laughs> think about last week one day. Think about a day. And I want you to write down how do you spend your time. Ready? In your, oh, I love it. Can I, can I pick up your for a second? <laughs> Look. Now, here's what I want you to do. In your folder, you have the levels of intensity for coaches. Level one, level two, level three. That's, it's based on, we did that as our coaches looked at some works from A to B. It's a list. I want you to take a look at the list. Can I focus up for a second? Here's the list. Oh, actually, why don't I put it right here? There we go. I'm so smart. It takes me a while. I want you to take a look at your activities, what you do, and I want you to look at this and see where does it fall? Does it fall in one? Does it fall in two? Does it fall in three? Now understand that coaching is situational. Some teachers, you may have a different relationship. 
and your progress may be different. But remember I said a typical day. Take a look at that. There's also something in there that says level one, level two, level three, and it looks like this. And I want you to go back to your original list, and I want you to put it in. Where's your level one, where's your level two, where's your level three? And that's your homework. After the reception tonight, after you had a couple of drinks, it's great. <laughs> 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 Okay, I'm going to put something as a slide. 